Hey guys, Montel Williams here, and then so glad that you've tuned in for another edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, where we try to bring you as much information as we can to help you navigate this really daunting and confusing space when it comes to selecting cannabis products for you and your family and making good choices if you make a decision in that regard. And we happen to be coming to you today from Orlando, Florida, which was the home of the Florida Medical Cannabis Conference here at the Gaylord Palms Hotel. And we're really, really, really blessed today to have as a special guest, a guest who is a board certified urologist for 38 years experience in private and academic practice. He's a professor of clinical urology and a visiting scholar at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and serves as a medical officer at the company called Ianthus, which provides comprehensive solutions for financing, managing, and licensed cannabis cultivators, processors, and dispensaries throughout the United States. Dr. Richard Boxer, thank you so much for being with us today, sir. Well, it's a great pleasure, Montel. Thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. Thank you. And you know, what, what, you know, I, we, we asked this question of uh, just about every one of our guests. What brought you after 30 years plus of being involved in urology to the cannabis space. What actually got you involved in cannabis? Well, what happened was that I, um, a patient of mine, who happened to be also be a friend, but a patient of mine had metastatic renal carcinoma, which is kidney cancer that had spread. And unfortunately for him, it had spread to his bones, which caused intractable, just horrible pain. He uh, he had tried a variety of different opioids in order to try to dampen down the pain, but didn't like the side effects, really wasn't touching his pain anyway. And he came to me and said, what do you think about cannabis or marijuana? Because it's available in Los Angeles at the time, this was about six or seven years ago, for medical purposes. And um, I didn't have a clue. I said that I, I certainly had heard about it as a possibility for pain control. Um, you know, everyone who grew up in the 60s, if you can remember anything, you may be able to remember that there was cannabis available on the campuses, but I really didn't know how it would be able to help him. And so I said, go for it, try it. He went to several head, show, head stop, excuse me, head shops. Either or one, what they call you know, dispensaries, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. in, um, uh, in two in Beverly Hills and one in San Fernando Valley and got just a terrible experience. He he went in, it was, it was dirty, it was um, disorganized. They had individuals behind the counter who were 20-somethings who really didn't have any knowledge whatsoever as it applied to medicinal. And they probably had personal experience, maybe even at the moment they were interviewing the patient. But in any case, he bought some stuff. It, may be, it made marginal difference. But he came back with his wife to UCLA and said, in a very, and he was very angry because how could um, medicine be available and not have anybody have any knowledge about it. So I took that to heart and I said, you know, I'm going to try, I'm going to learn about it. And then I learned all the, you know, the problems w with uh, the knowledge base being inhibited by the federal government. Yeah, but the knowledge base was also not just inhibited by the federal government, but inhibited by your peers. You know, if you look back over time, I mean, this is information that's been available here in information that's been studied, we identified CBD back in 1940. There was research being done back in 1940, actually isolated and replicated in 1946. And literally, this is a product that our own federal government in 1999 filed a patent on based on research that it had been doing for over 30 years at places like the University of Mississippi and funding research in places like Israel. It, it's astonishing to me that you know, and, and when we get a chance, and I've talked to lots of doctors, I've been involved in, in this cannabis uh, movement now for over 20 years. I started getting involved back in 1980, really, well, well no, not really, in 1999, when I got diagnosed with MS. And, and my first, one of my first bouts, you know, precipitated intractable neuropathic pain in my feet and my legs and left side weakness. And so I got involved in, uh, well, the, the first course of action that doctors prescribed for me were opioids and literally almost got me addicted uh, to the point that, you know, at one point in time I was taking back then in 19, really in 2001, back before we had oxycodone available, you know, I had a doctor prescribed to me Talwin and I was taking up to five to seven Talwin a day, which was really ignorant at the time. And I, I had a very, very good doctor who you know, as one of the top MS specialists in the country said to me, you know, in 2001, I'm done with you, man. I'm not writing you any more opioids because I know what you're doing. You're out doctor shopping 
and I was doctor shopping. I had a series of doctors around the country who would write me a prescription in a heartbeat for anything I wanted. Back then it was Percocet, Oxacet, you name it. I was able to get it, Vicodin, and I was getting no relief. And he said to me, look, I'm, I'm never going to say I said this to you, which was threw me a little bit because he was a doctor. He said, but I've heard from a couple of other patients that I have who have MS, who have the similar type of pain that you have, that this stuff called marijuana works. And it works, you know, I can't tell you, you know, he's, I, at that time, this is 2000, he said there's something called CB, CB, CD, CBD. He didn't even know what it was, CBD. He was saying there's something called CB something. And you ought to look that up and see if you can find that version of marijuana. And you were talking about in the 60s, we find out that here in the United States of America, you know, most of the growers who were growing cannabis back then were trying their best to grow the CBD out of the plant, trying to see if they could grow a higher level of THC in the plant than CBD. And so I once made it a mission back in 2000 to just start digging in as hard as I could to research. I, mean, I got a degree in engineering from the United States Naval Academy. I did, you know, close to 22 years in the military. Um, I was a special duty intelligence officer, and I figured, let me just apply the same, you know, skills that I had to researching. You know, I, I'm a Russian linguist, so at the time I was dealing in, in special intelligence stuff. So if I'm researching something like that, let me research this. And I started digging in and realized that I was blown away by the fact that even back in 2000, there were, you know, a myriad of documents that had been published talking about the effects of cannabis. And I shifted over from using the opioids to using cannabis and finally got some relief for the first time. But you are absolutely right. The majority of the people who were selling products back then had no idea what they were selling and definitely didn't know what they're talking about. And even as we get to today, we're still at a place where, you know, I liken it to the Wright brothers pushing a wooden plane down a hill. You know, we've got probably 30 years before we're really going to catch up with the research that we should have been doing for the last 90 years, right? Well, I certainly am not here or ever would defend what my colleagues have done sure. in, in, as it applies to preventing research. Mm -hmm. But my colleagues, I, the vast majority, I think, uh, would be very interested in doing research in cannabis if no. the federal government would allow it to happen. Sure. It, it's on Schedule 1, as you well know, Correct. along with LSD, heroin, ecstasy. And if you have NIH grants coming into your facility, university, hospitals, whatever, and then you start doing cannabis research, mm -hmm. you are at risk of losing all your NIH grants. Which seems crazy, right? So the fact that we know now for over 40 years, we have been funding with taxpayer dollars research that's supposedly been being done at the University of Mississippi. We've also been funding research in Israel. We've funded research under Dr. Mishulam and several other places around the world. Our federal government, our taxpayer dollars have gone to this research, yet that research is not available. In some cases, even today, we still, from the University of Mississippi, send out once a month canisters of marijuana grown at the University of Mississippi yet they don't even track the patients that they're sending you to. Well, it's not just that. The yeah. University of Mississippi grow site is trash. Right. Um, and it, it has a very low percentage of THC. Sure. It is moldy. It is of no value. In fact, that's the reason why uh, uh, Dr. Sue Sisley in Arizona sued the FDA. 14 years ago, I had Irv Rosenthal, Rosenthal on my show, and I got a canister of his his cannabis that they were sending him. And back then we knew, it wasn't 14 years ago, it was about 17 years ago, and tested back then some of the remnants that were in that can and recognized how bad that cannabis was. Oh, for sure. And, it, and it, it's just a demonstration that, that, the, that the politicians are trying to rule the, the way patients are treated. Just like they, they indicate or legislate the, number, the, the diseases that people can use cannabis for sure. called, called qualifying conditions. Uh, it, it is a tragedy because 200 million or more Americans have access to a drug and the drug has been vaped, it's been rubbed, it's been inserted, it's been swallowed, it's been um, smoked, it's, it's, and yet it's never been studied. Right. I mean, it, and there's nothing in this country that has ever not gone through the FDA that's available in, uh, to the American public. And so therefore, the American public is severely harmed sure. by the by the government. Now, I don't. I'm not advocating 100% legalization. I'm not advocating that every every state should have uh, full recreational or adult use. 
I'm only advocating getting off Schedule 1 so that research can be done. If it is addictive, I want to know. If it is harmful, I want to know. If it is helpful for any particular disease, I want to know so that I can help my patients. I'm I've, For the last 38 or 40 years I've been practicing medicine, I've always been patient-centric. Mm -hmm. I've um, done an enormous amount of health policy on the national level. And this is a health policy and a, con uh, a compassionate um, uh, uh, a compassionate method of helping people. So by withholding it, we are actually hurting people rather than helping people. And it's even more so in the veterans who, who our country has sent them to war. They've been patriotically going to war. They come back, they have PTSD, and they go to a veteran's hospital, and, and it's absolutely forbidden to even talk about it. And I, it was very interesting. I, I spent some time with Dr. Mishulam in his laboratory in Israel now almost 10 years ago, and not only talked to him, but also talked to the representative who was responsible for the Israeli military's implementation of cannabis for PTSD back then. And the research is there. There is research out there. Now, whether or not you can get your hands on it is another thing, but the research has been done and been done over and over and over again. I, I just, I, I get I get frustrated in the fact that this is something that's been around, you know, depending on who you listen to, it's been around for at least 5,000 years, and we've yet to see one death from marijuana overdose, yet there are people who die every day in this country from an overdose of aspirin. Well, the, the, the reason why, and I always like to talk about this because it's, it makes so much sense, it's so intuitive, the reason why marijuana has never killed anybody, and opioids routinely do, is that there are receptors in the brain for opioids and there are receptors in the brain for marijuana. Yes. The receptors in the brain for opioids, aside from other portions, are in the brainstem. The brainstem controls respirations. You take too many opioids, it shuts down the brainstem, it shuts down the, the respirations. Marijuana has no receptors in the brainstem, so therefore it cannot kill. Right. It's part of our, you know, again, most people don't know that, you know, we have this, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, this secondary sympathetic nervous system called the endocannabinoid system, which is, you know, CB1, CB2 connectors, you're right, in the brain and in the peripheral nervous system that actually are agonists to... What, uh, the two types of, and we there could end up being three, four, five, 10, 20, we don't know. 10 years ago, they used to say there were 64 cannabinoids. Now, research around the world is showing that there could be anywhere from 160 to 300 cannabinoids, and we're starting to identify them. And yet, you know, as we identify them, I think the majority of the people in this country have gotten all caught up on one television special that said CBD, 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 and made that the pinnacle when we know that, you know, there are cannabinoids like CBG, CBN, THCA, THCV, CBDV. There's thousands of them. And Dr. Michelin, who's the guy who, you know, we've given credit to being the most recent godfather of cannabinoid research, claimed with his research that we know that they work in a entourage synergistic effect. Yet we have been working to isolate one and think that that one is all people need. And then we've got this product being sold across the country where, as you test it, you know, we're finding out that people are literally just lying straight through their teeth, right? Well, the, 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 the real problem, I think, is fundamentally at the political level. Uh, and the war on, on drugs, which was started by Nixon, was fundamentally a it started by Anslinger, you mean, back in 1937. Yes, yeah. well, that was the, the 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 tax act, but but the war on drugs. But but that that tax act really wasn't a tax act. That was an act that you know that started. I think when you say Nixon, if we move him forward, Nixon just made sure that he continued the assault because Anslinger identified and tried to make sure that cannabis was literally related to those people. You right. Know, well, continue, it was it was yeah, fundamentally continue, continue slavery. Right. It was fundamentally a racist act. Absolutely, to continue and, slavery. And, and it was just not just for for blacks. It was for Hispanics. Correct. People Anyone who was them, 80, not, not us. Eighty percent of the people arrested for marijuana, which is a racist term to begin with, for since 1937, is eighty percent of them are people of color. Eighty yeah, percent. Yeah. But the but the great catch twenty two of all time relative to certainly to medication, mm -hmm. is that the politicians say you have to prove that marijuana is helpful or not dangerous. 
in order to get it to get it off schedule one. Then they say we will not give you any money to do that because it's on schedule one. There's no way of getting around it. Right. So it's a it's catch twenty two. So what what needs to be done is that if the the I mean, even Donald Trump is saying he'd probably sign the States Act. Each of the Democratic nominees uh, or candidates for nomination are saying that they want to get it off Schedule One and and actually um, go further than that. But nonetheless, to decriminalize it. But nonetheless, it you know it's it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that time, and in between, they're going to suffer because of it. Right. When you talk about research, let's talk a little bit more about the research itself. I mean, you know, I guess the farm bill did allow for some research. It's very confusing, uh, but it, the Fed didn't authorize anybody to do so, right? Well, it, the farm bill it, it you know passed in two thousand eighteen, and it uh, it allows hemp to be uh, grown and distributed. Although some yeah. states still. Don't even allow that. But nonetheless. Right. And then hemp being allowed to be grown has to have this arbitrary number that people picked of the 0.3% THC or less. Correct. Which was an arbitrary number to select it. Nobody knows why that number was picked that way. Whether it should have been 0. 0.2, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.7, 1.0, nobody really knows, right? So it, it, There's no knowledge about that. I think right. it, it may have something to do with, with the blood levels, but upon, um, you know, this determining whether or not a person is is supposedly inebriated in some manner or just that would disqualify them for one purpose or another. It doesn't really matter. The point is that that the that the um, 0.3 percent is in law. Hemp is allowed, but hemp has CBD, um, and so therefore the hemp CBD is now sold. In gas stations, it's right. sold everywhere. But then you look at the hemp CBD that's sold in gas stations, and you pull up, and people are starting to test some of the pills or some of the tinctures, and finding out there's probably less than you know one percent CBD in some of the well, products being sold. That that's what what's so nuts about the way the the government is has handled this particular thing, as well as all aspects, even in the states. When there was a vaping crisis mm -hmm. just recently, the vaping crisis um, was due to Tainted uh, THC or um, CBD, whatever it was, but for inhalation, yeah. and it was done by illegal individuals. Correct. So what does what does the government do? Closes down the legal, because they, that's the only place where they can have any actionable um, any action. That is, they know where CBD is being sold legally. They don't know where it's being sold illegally, so they close down the legal, even though the, those are the facilities that test the product to be sure it is pure and does not is not tainted. So it's it's counterintuitive. Right. I mean what what do you think it's gonna take? I mean, you're working in a company that literally is really one of the forefront companies in cannabis in America today, Anthus. And what's it gonna take? How are we going to be able to convince, you know, politicians that they need to stop for a second and reevaluate their stand, one. And number two, listen to Doctors like yourself, who could literally help them, you know, write legislation, help them write, you know, the 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 criteria we need to move this forward. How, what, what what do we have to do, sir? I think the only thing that can be done is through the political process, which is painful. Mm -hmm. But it's it's when you have nearly sixty seven percent of the population saying that they are for uh, cannabis or for legal, legal legalizing marijuana in some way, mm -hmm. medical or otherwise, then the politicians who will who are running for office will, if they run against marijuana, they are going to be thrown held out of office. Right, held accountable. Exactly. And so when you get someone to the level of Donald Trump even reading the tea leaves, literally and figuratively, that, that marijuana is a popular um, – a popular product. I think the second he figures out how he can get Uday and Kuse involved, next thing you know, it becomes legal. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it it isn't all that difficult to understand their their thinking process. The problem is that they put themselves before they put the the people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, take a little talk a little bit about what do you what do you let, let's talk a little bit about what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions are about cannabis use to begin with. That's really like that's the the. the this launching point for where our biggest problems are is misconceptions. Still, till today, there are those who think that marijuana or cannabis is a gateway drug. 
Right. That's always the first thing that everyone says, and particularly the people who are against it. Even the people who, who are for it are, become worried that it might be a gateway drug. The Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, put out a book um, a few years ago. Um, and one of the things it stated unequivocally was that there is no evidence that it's a gateway drug. They also said that, that there are three areas where it has been shown to be very effective. One is chemotherapy-induced nausea, MS muscle spasm, and chronic pain. And, but but as, far, as it applies to the fear of marijuana, the reefer madness from 37 and, and all, on, and, and all the, the, the uh, negatives that have come th- since, is that because ga- it is a gateway drug, uh, it is said, that it leads to cocaine and heroin. And you know, if you look at the population of people who are using heroin, had they ever used marijuana? Probably. <laughs> had they ever had alcohol? Probably. probably have they had you know have they had mother's milk probably, probably. um and caffeine so, probably yeah right. and so it is genetic or addictive personalities that will un, that will become addicted to a variety of different things but that doesn't mean that by taking a smoking marijuana or taking a marijuana pill or whatever will then suddenly you're going to be shooting heroin mm-hmm. and do you think i mean in general across the board like you know places like you know um, the university you're attached to, David Geffen School of Medicine, would they be interested if made legal, would they be interested, let's say made legal, taken off of Schedule 1, would organizations like that be interested in testing for cannabis? Because I, I mean, I literally, I, I speak before and, and and travel around the country and I've been doing this again since really 2001, you know, helping different states, you know, either move legislation forward to, and I've been a very big proponent. I'm, I, I Early on, I was never a proponent of, of just blatant legalization. I've been a proponent of getting people out of the middle of a conversation between a patient and a doctor. I feel very strongly about the fact that, you know, this entire movement, you know, what people don't remember is back in, you know, oh, the, in the 90s, there were people being dragged out of their homes in Northern California on gurneys with IVs in their body being taken and put in jail because they were growing a plant in their backyard to try to get some relief. This whole this whole movement started in the last 30 years because of patients. And we have left patients on the battlefield. Now, all of a sudden, because there's this big green rush and this big gold rush and everybody wants to make money, even some people who are medical professionals have stepped doctors have stepped up and decided to be on boards of companies, not because they're trying to get the patient off the battlefield, but people trying to make money. Now, we're at a place where I think if we could literally try to convince this industry to a number one police itself and number two, try to remember that if you put the patient first, the profits will come second. And again, I believe since we're really at this, you know, you know, the Wright brothers pushing that wooden plane down a hill point, there are untold riches to be made. And I could care less about people making money. Make your money if you want, but make sure you do so with the objective of relieving someone else's suffering. But that doesn't seem to be objective of a lot of these companies that are out here right now. Well, I think um, there's certainly... I always believe that you can do good and do well at the same time. Absolutely. And that um, if you do the right thing, whether it's in medicine or law or any, any, actually anything, um, if you do a good job, you'll be compensated for it. As it applies to marijuana, uh, our company and many, many companies, I'm not going to um, necessarily state that a specific company is doing the wrong thing. Yes, there is, there is greed. Yes, there is, um, you know, action made towards making a profit, but within the vast majority of the companies, they, uh, they comply within their dispensaries to a third party testing. Now, what absolutely surprises me is that people who will go to Whole Foods and demand a, an organic piece of celery will go across the street and take and buy some stuff in the black market and, and inhale it. <laughs> or, even, or even buy something from a dispensary that's, that's been tainted with butane. But, per, you know, certainly, but 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 in the in most dispensary in the legal dispensaries, mm-hmm. there is third party uh, testing so that you know exactly what's in it. Whereas if you save the taxes and you and you get a, a cheaper um, version of 
uh, of you don't even know of what uh, in the black market. You're going to inhale it or 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 swallow it, and you have no idea what it is. And so it, it it astounds me that intelligent people are willing to put something into their lungs or their bodies um, by ingesting it and not having even a clue as to what's inside it. Yeah, and I think some of that's uh, is scary because, you know, when you take a look at, you know, the motivations by several states. I mean, look, very recently, you know, Governor Cuomo decided that, uh, you know, in the next bill that they're trying to push through it in New York State, you know, there's going to be a 50% tax put on cannabis. Why, why would you do that? Where does the 50% tax come into play on a medication? It's really ignorant that we, again, put profits before we put the patient. Well, it's just driving people into the black market. Correct. Um, there's just, and driving people into products that you were just talking about that yes. are tainted and, and poorly produced. It, 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 is, um, it, it isn't thoughtful right. to, um, to tax something, a product, and expect people to pay that for that product at that much higher level than they'd be able to get it someplace else. Correct. So it it makes absolutely no sense. Yes, the state wants to make money in order to improve the infrastructure or whatever that wants to do. And that's fine. I mean, they, they do it all the time on every product. But to make a, a, a usury tax on a product to think that in some way that's going to massively improve the state's finances – is backward thinking. And so, and I think part of that's from because, you know, when states like Colorado and states like California reported initially some of their, you know, their, their, their big boon in tax dollars, everybody else wants to catch up. So now we got, what, 34 states and 33 states in the District of Columbia that have some form of cannabis law, whether it be recreational, whether it be medicinal. And every one of those states is trying to figure out how they can get a larger amount of tax dollars out of the product when, again, all we're doing is, I think, forcing this back underground again. And I can't help but think that this might not be – I'm not a conspiracy theory nut, but, you know, this could be the plan to go back to where this was 20 years ago, which is really ignorant to me. Well, um, I, I don't necessarily ascribe to, uh, you know, conspiracy sure. theories. Mm -hmm. However – um, e economists, brilliant economists, look at taxation and products, and they know that there is a line that you cross that will push people into the black market. And if you cross that line thinking that you're just going to get more money, in fact, you actually get less. Uh, right. So it's uh, it, it just isn't crystal clear thinking. That is for sure. What is Ianthus's role in this? I mean, you're in a, you're you're an organization that is you know put together to help you know, give financial solutions and, and management, uh, you know, uh, recommendations to cannabis companies. Are you also doing the same thing for governments at the state level? Well, what we, uh, Ianthus is a, is a, like a holding company. Okay. Uh, we were the first ones to go to Canada to, into the public markets. Others followed quickly, but we went into the public markets to get money. So then we bought licenses around the country. For, right now, we have a license in Florida. It's called Grow Healthy. But we have a license in Massachusetts. It's called uh, Mayflower. Or um, we have 10 different states. Actually, we're, we have licenses in 11. But we're, we're dispensing. Um, we, we grow. We manufacture. We dispense vertical integration of the finest, we believe, the finest quality because we stand behind the product. We believe that, and this has really been my role. I've been always considered the chief medical officer I, Colleague Randy Maslow is a, is the lawyer, and Hadley Ford, a brilliant um, um, uh, finance individual, was on the finance side. And so the three of us had a vision that we would create a the best business possible, and to bring the best product possible, so that each and every state that we have a license in and that we are growing and and dispensing and manufacturing will give to the patient. The, what they richly deserve, the best product possible. Now, we also participate in lobbying. That is, mm -hmm. we, um, like several companies around the, the country, uh, pay lobbyists in order to educate, what well, we think educate, the, the, both the public and the politicians. Um, for my part, I talk to politicians. I, I've done that in lots of different ways, not just for cannabis, but for health policy in general for decades. And uh, what I try to do is bring reason 
to the to the table and say, okay, if you believe that it is addictive or if it is harmful, then give then take it off schedule one and let's prove it. Or if you think that it may help your your constituents, then take it off schedule one and let's prove it. Don't inhibit, don't shackle the greatest the greatest right researchers in the world, which are within our universities. Whether it's you know, pick pick a university. Sure. They have a medical center. They do brilliant work, and let the Nobel laureates and let the National Academy of Medicine um, um, recipients let everyone go at it and determine whether or not it's a good product. Like here in the state of Florida right now, I guess there's a there's a move afoot to try to see if uh, you know this, this was really a crazy state um, to begin with when it came to comes to its medical marijuana uh, policies, but this this new um, I don't want to call it. Though. Uh, there's a, there's a new move afoot to see if they can cap now the THC level of you know cannabis at ten percent. Some again another arbitrary number that someone selected. And, you know somebody may say that well you know if you go back twenty years ago you know almost all cannabis plants in in, in the world really had probably between ten and thirteen percent at the most at the most THC levels. And so all we've been doing for the last 20, 25 years has been breeding at higher, higher, higher. And was it ever necessary? But why would, are you guys lobbying here to see if you can, you can help affect that law change? Well, you have to think about what does it make sense? First of all, every, every manufacturer, every grower in this state, their product, their, their plants have more than 10%. What are you going to do? Burn them all down? I mean, um, that won't happen obviously. So then what do you do? You take the, the uh, product that is at 10%, 9.999%, then, then you ask the, the public or tell the public they can only get a 10% product. So well, they'll just simply double it. They will buy it twice as much. Costing them twice as much money. Costing them twice as much money and inhaling some of the, the product that, that goes along with the THC and CBD twice as much, causing twice as much potential lung injury. It makes no sense. And um, there's, you know, if you, then then what might happen is that people will take a product and cut it with some some tainted um, product and say, this is 10%, but it's really was maybe 20%. And then they cut it with some awful stuff to make it down to 10%. It is, you can't legislate. And besides, people are very smart. They're going to work around this, but they'll work around it in a manner which, probably will be caught, will be deleterious to their health. Right. Absolutely. Now, are you, are, 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 would I, is Ianthus working down here in a lobbying way to see if they can? Yes. Yeah, so Randy, yeah, Randy Maslow and, and others are, are working in concert with, with um, other corporations, that, but also individuals. Most importantly, the people who are, would suffer because of it. They're patient organizations, nurses organizations, doctor organizations. They're all working. And it's not actually even in the form of a bill yet, but it is it is trying to become one by whispering throughout the, the um, various members of the of the legislature. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about. I think you've got some uh, to say about telemedicine, and how do you think telemedicine plays into cannabis and cannabis distribution? Well, I, I helped start the uh, telemedicine industry about sixteen or seventeen years ago with a company called Teladoc, and the um, uh, the I was able to write the processing procedures, everything had to do with, with regulation. And I'm a big advocate of telemedicine. I think it definitely saved this country so much uh, the, money. Telemedicine is, goes to my sweet spot, which is access to care. And you get affordable, quality act, you know, care in a convenient manner through remote care. And that means that the 100 million Americans who live away from where a doctor is have access to care through remote care or through telemedicine. And as it applies to telemedicine and cannabis, I thought that it would be a, um, a great combination. But the, the laws of Florida state absolutely that you cannot do telemedicine uh, for the initiation of care for a patient on cannabis or that it would receive cannabis. Uh, for the initiation, yes. you can follow up. That well, way. you know, then then I said, okay, fine. Well, every 210 days, how they chose that number, I have no idea. But every 210 days, a um, Florida resident who has a, a a license or a card to get cannabis has to re-up. Well, why not do telemedicine for those people? 
they, they say they can't do that for those people either. And so it is a perfect vehicle for people who have, need to have access to the care who don't, who can't afford a card or can't afford the doctor's visit or just simply want to be able to re-up um, and be able to get their medication. So, you know, to me anyway, um, I think that it's, it would be very beneficial. I can um, talk about telemedicine and how it's helped the, the world, really, but certainly it would be reasonable to do it in uh, the cannabis field. Also, one of the things that, I, that eventually will happen in Florida, because it's happened everywhere, is that there will become adult use for the product. And we, when it happens, I have no idea, but when it happens, I believe that this will put the onus upon the dispensaries even more than presently as far as education. Education before medication. And so um, if, you, if the patients suddenly have access to the product without having to go through gatekeepers, which are the doctors, and the doctors who many, you know, the vast majority have knowledge who are allowed to, to give the, the, uh, the licenses, but the patients will go directly to the dispensary and with no knowledge, they'll be naive and then it puts all that extra onus upon the, the patient care representatives behind the desk to teach the patient about cannabis. So um, I think that the adult use will be very beneficial to the patients who need cannabis for a variety of different maladies, such as chronic pain. And there are, there are you know, and the, I, I've, I've been one who's said this over and over again. I think that people who gravitate toward cannabis rather than gravitate towards alcohol are gravitating to cannabis for an underlying medical reason anyway, even if they won't admit it themselves. The majority of people who would shift over and use cannabis may be shifting over because they want to feel better, maybe shifting over because they want to get a better night's sleep. Maybe they want to be able to, to have access to something that's not going to give them a hangover in the morning. And so, you know, in their heart of hearts, if you sit down and you talk to people who are supposedly recreational users, there's probably an underlying medical reason of some sort that they gravitated towards a product anyway. For sure. There's 100 million Americans have chronic pain. Now, 100 million Americans don't use cannabis. They use opioids or they use uh, lots of, of a leave or whatever, um, the NSAIDs the, or, or aspirin. Billions of pills are consumed every year for pain. Now, those 100 million Americans um, and more, but those 100 million Americans, once it becomes federally legal, or, or let's put it this way, statewide legal first, and once it becomes completely legal for adult use in, let's say, Florida, those 100 million Americans or those portions thereof in Florida will go to a dispensary and say, I have bad back pain. I no longer want to take so many aspirin, so many, so many Aleve, so many Tylenol, whatever. I don't want to take opioids. It's killing me. Um, what, what should I take? And, and hopefully they'll be talking to somebody who's just, you know, not you know, just going out back and had a little, you know, recreational themselves. Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, Ianthus, others as well, but certainly Ianthus um, and myself personally, as the chief medical officer of the corporation, I go to every dispensary and I educate and we have, we have brochures. We make sure that our patient care representatives truly are patient centric as I have been all my life. So I've, I've done health policy around the, the, the United States on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat. I've, um, I've represented the United States, the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done a lot of things that are patient centric, and that is critical so that patient, when a person walks in, they know that they've got an advocate there for them. Great. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the things is, you know, I, I think one of the biggest problems in this industry right now, still, even today, is education, education, education. I mean, I think, and that's in every level of it, uh, educating the, the, the providers on who their most, you know, advantageous demographic is right now, as far as, you know, who we're looking to sell to. I mean, I think, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, this whole attitude that, it, that the higher the THC, the better, because you want to appeal to a group that can't even afford to buy the product. I mean, you know, when you look at, you know, where, where most of the marketing is, is directed at is maybe that 18 to 34, which is supposedly the sweet spot for TV, where we know that, in fact, places like Israel have made cannabis a geriatric drug, where, you know, when you hit the age of 70, you can walk into several hospitals, put down your ID card and walk out with a, you know, ounce and someone will have a conversation with you about how that may alleviate some of those 20 to 30 other pills that you're taking may help you reduce that. So 
when do you think we're going to be come back around? I mean, I know Anthos has been working on educating, but when can we get the rest of this industry to understand that that's the most important thing they need to do is to educate, educate, educate. Well, conferences like this, the Florida Medical Cannabis Conference gets together doctors and, and other advocates, nurses, social workers to, to talk about not just educate each other, but to push each other to educate more people. Uh, it's it starts out as a as a small circle and gets larger and larger. And when when you're faced with federal government um, inhibition or sure. obstacles, uh, you know, I've always in 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 both medicine and particularly in business, some you know I see uh, opportunity when other people see obstacles. There are obstacles, but that means that there's enormous opportunity in order to try to educate through programs like yours and others that. Um, will bring the truth to the the public and not be inhib not, not have the public inhibited by the false information that is that is put out by people who also have financial reasons to to inhibit it. Mm. How about any any new projects in, uh, on the horizon? What are you what are you working on right now? Well, um, Certainly, I, I'm I'm interested in educating on, on cannabis, but I do a lot of health policy work, as I mentioned earlier, and I've been working on both sides of the aisle to try to improve the way healthcare is delivered, and the the, the Medicare for all versus versus a public option. I've written about a lot in in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Harvard Business Review uh, with a colleague at Harvard. And I, mean, I think tele telemedicine for all would be a good initiative that would kind of help move some, you know, help us understand a little bit better, not just for those people living in remote areas, but those people who are, you know, underserved, you know, the people who are, you know, on that, that right on the border of the poverty line, you know, to give them an opportunity to be able to call in and talk to a doctor, you know, I, I, it's probably 60% or 70% of, you know, all doctor's visits are things that could be handled by telemedicine. Are they well, not? actually, I've done a lot of research on that, as you can imagine. And, and if you look at the emergency rooms or doctor's offices, or urgent care centers, minimally 25% of all visits could be handled remotely. And um, now, if you then break it down to numbers, there are approximately 1.2 billion interactions between doctor and patient every year in this country. There are approximately, at 25%, that would be about 300 million visits could be done remotely. Right now, there is maybe 5 million. And that means that that's the reason why hospitals you know, university medical centers and private corporations are getting into telemedicine because even though it's been around for 16 years um, and which is very rapid development within the medical field because it's generally a conservative group, but um, the telemedicine is growing so fast and more and more companies, more and more hospitals are getting into it because they believe that it is something that is very valuable to the patient and allows them to catch more patients into their system. And is this part of when you say you're working on the initiative, looking at whether or not, you know, we have, you know, um, Medicaid for all, Medicare for all, or, you know, uh, some sort of a, a, a public buy-in, is this part of that? Well, not exactly, um, because it, it fits into all aspects. Telemedicine fits into public option, Medicare for all, private insurance, uh, Medicaid, whatever. It, it goes across the board because it's so efficient. And we reduce cost, though. Yes, yes, it does. And but but because of the the present day uh, concern by the Democrats as well as the Republicans is where healthcare is going and how we can more efficiently do healthcare. Uh, why there is a crisis? Why people are without healthcare? Eighty, supposedly eighty million people are either underinsured or uninsured, even though we have Obamacare. Um, the uh, what, what I look at is. Are there new ways or better ways of delivering health care with being patient-centric and when people care about each other and care about the better care of, of each other, the health care, then there has to be a better way. And the Democrats and the Republicans don't own all the good ideas. There are some ideas that are good on both sides, and so I try to bring those ideas together and write about it. Oh, great. Now, how about from an Iantha standpoint, 
Any new future ventures? Anything going on? Well, we we're constantly ex- um, expanding. We're constantly looking at better products. We're constantly um, looking at the genetics of the products we have to improve them. We are growing as a company. We're growing, having more and more dispensaries around the state of Florida and around the country. Um, we are um, advocating for the patient in every possible way with with government entities. Uh, so, well. The, the most important thing that we can do as a company is educate our our patient care representatives, educate our the patients, and deliver the finest product possible. And that's what we do. We're we're all about quality. And if you want people, if people wanted to get some information, where would they go? What website or is there a website they can go up to? to well, sure. There's www.ianthus.com. I A N T H U S, like Sam. Okay, and if they can ask questions, if they have some questions, they can go up. And oh, for sure, for sure. And we're always interested in helping. Oh, my goodness. My God. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Boxer, for being here today and participating on Let's Be Blunt. I mean, I think that one of the things that people need to have is more information and good, solid information, and that's exactly what you provide. So and I want to thank you for having this program because without you, without this voice, um, we, we, as a public, will not be nearly as educated and nearly aware of the value that cannabis can have. Absolutely. So we'd love to have you back sometime. I mean, you can do it by phone next time. We have, don't have to be in the same city, but I'd love to have you back on the podcast again. Just uh, reach out. Get, get reach out. I'll we be there. Do so. And you <laughs> can reach out at home by clicking on that little clicker right there and subscribe Subscribe to Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And if you subscribe and leave a review, you know, that'll qualify you for one of the magic butter making machines that we're giving away over the next couple of weeks. So go on up and leave a review and, you know, participate. Thanks so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt. Make sure you tune in for the next one.